everybody. <clears throat> How's it going? Welcome to the second ever episode of CKCB Presents. Um, I'm Bill. And I'm Paul. And joining us, we have special guest Nora Ashley. Hi. How are you doing, Nora? I'm good. Nora, if you remember, um, she was on with us um, on episode 73 and 74. She told her entire story about her experience with the troubled teen industry. Those assholes. <laughs> 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 and so we're we're gonna we're gonna talk more about the troubled teen industry in this episode of um, of Crimes Killers or CKCB presents. Now I I wanted because this is the second episode, the first episode of it. I didn't have the name picked out or anything like that. We just did it. And it, it, it was just for the future, the soon to be named, you know, extra episodes, whatever. But, but now this is, it's, it's, it's a separate podcast. Crimes, Killers, Colts and Beer is me and Paul. And we might have, um, you know, like fill ins come in. Like if, if Paul can't be here or if, if for whatever reason I can't be here, you might have yeah, a you'll probably call me 10 minutes before you need me and I'll have to hop on. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, you were on a couple of Patreon episodes, I believe. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, so there's going to be that. And then we're also, we'll also collaborate with other podcasts on, um, you know, on crimes, killers, cults and beer, but that's going to be the extent of bringing guests onto that show. So CKCB presents is going to be interviews. It's going to be like guests. It's going to be authors. It's going to be, you know, any, anytime we have guests or, or whatever, it's going to be CKCB presents. So it's, it's Paul may not be on all of those episodes because, um, there, he has a very strict schedule because he has a, you know, he has a, a job that takes a lot of his time. And he also has a, a podcast of his own, which takes up an awful lot of his time. So, 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 so if he, it's basically, if, if he can, he will be here, but you know, he might not be here type of thing. Yeah. Or I'll do a sneak peek, you know, like a cameo. <laughs> so, <laughs> so while we're at it, Paul, just tell, tell, you know, go ahead and plug your podcast. So the podcast is called The Seance, and you can find it on um, YouTube, Rumble, and anywhere you can listen or listen to your podcasts. Talks about metaphysical, paranormal, conspiracies, things that'll boggle the mind. Things that go bump in the night. And that too. Oh, yeah. Wait. <laughs> um, Nora, do you have your podcast up and running yet? I don't, actually. Um, Interesting. Uh, that 20th anniversary of getting sent away that I had in December knocked me on my fucking ass. <laughs> I have barely talked to any other survivors since then, since like October. Um, I have been like non-active in the, uh, activism community for the last few months. I'm like pull just pulling out of that though and, uh, starting to get active again. Um, but I mean, that's just proof right there of how deep this goes and how it's a lifelong thing. Right. Um, that shit was 20 years ago and it's still impacting me and my whole life enough that I've had to change my entire trajectory. Um, so, I mean, did something, did something happen or was it just like a, it all came rushing? No, back it's you, literally so just the trauma anniversary that triggered everything. Oh, wow. Um, um, yeah, and I can, I can obviously relate. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, yeah, at coming as a cult survivor, I mean, you know, I've got a few years on you. It's been a lot longer that since my ordeal ended than it has been since yours did. But, um, but yeah, but still it, yeah, there, there's, there's days when it's just like, I don't even want to get out of bed. <laughs> you know, I just want to, I just want to sit there and you know, fantasize about, um, you know, going, going all Norwegian black metal on yeah. some, on some of these <laughs> churches. <laughs> I mean, the last six months or so have been probably been the hardest in my entire healing journey from this. Like it didn't compare to anything else that I've dealt with in this at all. 
and it's so, been that long. So going, so going to the, the what she's what you're talking about is the there was like a a reunion of people of troubled teen industry survivors that had been you know just like from all over the country just coming together just to hang out and fellowship right and yeah, talk about everything basically so it was uh in october at the hilton in la um it, they called it survivor prom it was basically just an adult prom for us because that's like we didn't have things well, like yeah, proms and graduations and whatever yeah a lot but of you didn't get to do was, that because you were being yeah, rushed to the wilderness exactly and so it was kind of like a chance for us to like experience something normal that we missed out on but like i think the the bigger importance of it was like connecting with other survivors. Like right. I, I got to see a girl who I went to my boarding school with for the first time since I left. Um, and, and that was pretty, we, we were the only two people from mission mountain there. I mean, being such a small program that didn't surprise me, but um, that was like, I've seen a couple other girls since then, but the fact that it was there and it was, the 20th anniversary of when I got sent there and it was just, it was, it was really, it was really awesome. It was a really great experience too. Um, I think for everybody, because I mean, you can talk about and you can connect, you can network and you can, you know, build communities and stuff, but it just having that in-person kind of aspect brings a whole new uh, like understanding and appreciation and like just I don't know. It was awesome. I got to meet Alexi too. He's the one that introduced me to Marty. Who's the one I wrote all those articles with that got Daniel shut down. <laughs> like that was a good hug too. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was a great experience. Now, um, right now the troubled teen industry is like front and center where it needs to be. Um, Finally. because of, you know, there's two documentaries out. There's the program, which is the current one. And then there was one that came out last year called, um, hell camp. And I've, I've watched them both over the past, um, you know, over the past week or so getting ready for this episode. I mean, I already had a firm grip on it, but I had never actually watched anything documented or anything. I, I've seen a YouTube video here and there, but that was not the extent of it other than what I had read about and what, you know, you told us about on episode 73 and 74, but, um, but they, you know, but they're, they're finally in, in the, in the forefront and everything. And like lots of people, like if you hashtag, if you hashtag, I see you survivor, or if you hashtag TTI or trouble teen industry, you're going to find a whole shitload of people just wanting information, wanting, it's just like, okay, how did, how did I not know about this? People wanting to get involved. I was just telling somebody about that last night. Um, she was, it was somebody from my, my boarding school, actually. So the only real like involvement I've been able to have in the last few months is I started this Facebook group for people who went to my boarding school, Mission Mountain School, you know, a couple of years, three, four years ago, just as a way to keep connected with the people who I went there with. So we've had, we've been sitting at about 15, 16 members for the last like four years. Well, Kat Whitehead found me. I'm sure you've heard that name before. She's the girl that, mm -hmm. um, that testified in front of Congress about that program in 2008 at a congressional hearing, um, that ultimately got the program shut down. Uh, and that was one of the very first like big public, um, like outcries against the TTI and, she was involved in that. And she found me through my activism and reached out and was like, Hey, we went to the same place. And I was like, Oh my God, I've been trying to find you for years. <laughs> <laughs> and in two, about two weeks, uh, that group went from 15 members to 122. Oh, damn. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. That's awesome. Um, That's awesome. It's been incredible. But I was talking to a girl in there last night. She's like, you know, I, I've wanted to get involved in the activism, but I'm terrified. And I was just like, what about it scares you? Let's make that less scary. Right. And I was telling her that exact same thing. Well, here's what I would say to anybody who might, you know, especially a survivor that wants to get involved that doesn't know. And this is one survivor to another. Um, if it's scared, don't be scared. Because the people that you're going up against, they're the guilty ones. They're the ones with something to hide. They're the ones who need to be scared. Yep. And they're, they're the... Definitely. 
they're the ones that need to, you know, I mean, that, that scene in, in um, the program where they went to that church to talk to the, the PR director or whatever. And he's just like, he's just like, well, I don't know what y'all's problem is. And it's like, our problem is you. We grew up. It's like, well, why are you hearing about now? Well, we grew up. <laughs> we grew up. What the fuck did you think was going to happen? I was talking with Paul about this last night. And it was just like, in my case, in my case, I, I was going through that as a, as like a child into, yeah. into a teenager in the eighties during the satanic panic. But what's also hand goes hand in hand with that. I'm generation X motherfucker. What the fuck did you think was going to happen when I became an adult? You and know? it's not even just that it's, it's, it's not just that we grew up. The implication of the fact that we're talking about this shit now is one, what you did didn't break me. Right. And two, I've healed from it now. Mm-hmm. And, and now I'm the threat to you. Yeah. And they, they don't think, they don't think that, oh, it, it was so long ago. Well, I mean, it was just, you know, sweet. But, you well, know, we just- really saw that attitude when we went down and uh, for that groundbreaking down in Hurricane last year from the mayor. She, that's basically what she was saying. She came up to us afterwards and was like trying to be, you know, like sympathetic about our well, situations. Let's, and let's say, let's say that, was, oh, but that was 20 years ago. Yeah. Let's say that Colleen Stan, the, the girl in the box, let's say mm-hmm. that she somehow managed to escape and had never actually seen the face of her tormentor for the seven years that she was in captivity. Let's say that she escapes and then 20 some odd years later finds out who the son of a bitch is. Are they going to treat him any different? Are they going to treat him? Oh, it was 20 years ago. No, they're going to lock, they're going to lock his ass up. There's a reason there's no statute of limitations on sexual assault and murder. Yeah. Because it's implied that punishment for that should never like be cut off. Like it right. should always be an option. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I really you know, it just, I, when I was, I'm not so much the, the hell camp documentary, that one, uh, that one, <clears throat> that one I've seen <clears throat> a lot more mixed reviews on. It's because they, it they, they, they it's like they were trying to humanize the, it's like you, you had the one guy horse hair and he's sitting there with mm-hmm. a tube in his nose and all that stuff. And he's just like, Oh, you know, we, we were, we're, we're good people. I believe that what's his name. He, I believe he was a good person. And all no, he wasn't. And no, you weren't. Mm-hmm. No, no. And, and, and hell camp was okay. See, I, I actually haven't seen either of them yet because oh, I've really? been dealing, I've been dealing with trying to process this anniversary and stuff that like, I haven't been able to be involved with TTI stuff much at all. Um, but it's, I'm definitely not quite ready for those yet. I think hell camp sure. came out the same week of my anniversary of getting sent away. Uh, to wilderness. <laughs> um, and so I haven't even watched them yet, but what I've been able to see, which is kind of interesting is, is the TTI survivor community response to these kind of as an outsider, because I haven't seen them and I haven't formed my own opinion of them yet. Right. So I'm just seeing this influx of like responses and reactions from survivors about it without having formed my own yet. Uh, and hell camp kind of got mixed reviews. It was like, Oh yeah, you know, like good work, but like it kind of fell flat. I, agree. I have seen nothing but overwhelming positive responses and reactions to the program. Oh, yeah. Um, everybody is just like raving about how well it was done and, and, and how finally people have a resource instead of having to explain everything themselves and try to like, justify the fact that it's trauma we can be like hey dude there's a documentary go watch it <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, we don't have to do that emotional labor anymore no and I it's mean, covered it accurately enough in according to our lived re- re- or our, our lived experiences that you know i haven't really heard anybody make any comments about inaccuracies or anything like that um, no, or like it, misrepresentation or, you know, all those things that you, you worry about when it comes to documentaries, especially with something like this. Um, but yeah, the survivor community is just like, we're, we're so grateful for the work that was put in and, and the angle that was taken with that. And it was just done in such a, a perfect way that it's going to spread the awareness that, that we've needed to, to kind of get a 
get a like a foothold in. Yeah, there there was a scene in um, the program where um, they they had found that this one girl. She was um, basically a supposed to be like the hardcore drug user, and that was just a lie that she made up because they would keep punishing her until she admitted to it. But when they we've all done she, it. But when but when they yeah but when they when they um, initially drug tested her clean she was clean she had never touched mm-hmm. drugs in her life. But she, but her parents had shipped her there anyway, just because they couldn't get along with her for whatever reason. But, Same. um, but I they, found my paperwork. Yeah. That and it's outlines negative. that my parents were convinced that I was on meth. <laughs> I didn't do meth until actually until after I left the program. <laughs> and I've only done it once. But the, um, but they, they, they took that and, you know, she, she wrote a, a letter on, she wrote a note on it. It's just like, see, I, I was, I never touched drugs, bitch. You know, and she put, I had to do the she 12 put it, steps and everything. She put, it, she put it in the mailbox of, um, of this, this, her, the person, the person that was over her and, and there, and then, she, you know, shortly later, they're, they're, they're filming a process. They're, they're filming it. And all of a sudden the phone rings. It's the guy that was in charge of her. And he's just trying to make himself out to be a victim. And it's just like, oh, I had a hard time there too. And blah, blah, blah. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just like, you know, it's just like, I could, I do. could put, I could put myself in, I could put myself, you know, I could imagine me talking to one of the pastors of faith assembly, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it's just like, God damn it. It was satisfying. And at the same time, it was a letdown because you know what? It's just, like, you know, we don't, yeah, it's just, I don't want, anything from them as far as like you know i don't want their money i just want them to acknowledge that they that they were complicit in ruining yeah. the lives of many many people but they won't do it they will not do it one thing i think it is important to acknowledge though is is there there actually are staff out there who do genuinely mean well they want to help they're just so naive and ignorant and usually most of them are very young um, most of the staff that I knew that were what we call good staff um, mm-hmm. were under 25 when they worked in the industry. And most of them left before they were 25. Um, and they were, so they were barely older than we were. Um, we had a staff in my, my wilderness. Our senior staff was 22. I was 17. So like the people who were in charge of taking care of me and stuff and, who were out there expecting to die like the rest of us were, were barely more than kids themselves. Um, so like there, there definitely is, there definitely is trauma that the people who work at these places get. It's very different. Um, and it's, it's a little more, it's a lot more nuanced and, um, rare, I guess. Um, but it does happen. Uh, it, it's basically, they've been brainwashed as much as we are into believing what the program teaches, right. just like our parents. Yeah. Paul, if you have any questions or want to interject anything, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of doing the, re- I'm trying to do the research myself. So, you know, kind of going in and looking and, and researching on the back end here. Okay. <laughs> it's time from producing. But, wow. Uh, I, I, so I, as far as a recap, I mean, uh, Explain um, Hell Camp. Explain, um, you know, to, to myself because I'm I'm getting educated as as you know, along with some of the uh, listeners and viewers that might be questioning what actually happened. Okay, well, what I have a I have an idea. Hell Camp and the program are on Netflix. You can watch both of them. What I, um, Nora, just go ahead. And I said that we were going to do this at the beginning, and I didn't, and I forgot about it. I'm sorry, but um. I got myself on a roll, but um, Nora, go go ahead and just give us a nutshell of of your story, just to give him an idea of what we're talking about. Okay, so I at uh, I was sixteen, almost seventeen, four seventeen a.m. December twenty second, two thousand three. I got woken up by two strangers in my room screaming at me to get out of bed. Um, I was strip searched. I got dressed. They took they put me in a SUV took me to the airport, flew me to Utah, uh, and and I got to the headquarters for my wilderness program uh, before anybody told me anything. Like I had no clue where I was going. I had no who, clue who these people were, what I was doing, who I was with, 
And in the whole process of them like dragging me out of the house, my parents were nowhere to be found. Whoa. Um, that's actually a tactic that they use. Like, like it's all over the transport websites. It says, oh yeah, it keeps, it keeps your kids safer if we're able to use an element of surprise. Um, keeps you from running or fighting basically. Yeah. Um, but that actually is one of the most traumatic experiences, like instantaneous moments in that a TTI survivor can have a lot of times. Like that's the one thing that a lot of us is like, that's what we have nightmares about. That's what keeps us from sleeping. Um, is that, you know, shock of getting woken up and basically kidnapped. Uh, and then I spent five weeks in the West Desert of Utah, uh, three days after I got there, um, on Christmas Day, uh, we got hit with a blizzard that didn't stop for a week and dumped seven to nine feet of snow where we were at. Uh, our shelters consisted of tarps, um, and spring rated sleeping bags. Uh, I got horrendous frostbite. And then after that, I was sent to a therapeutic boarding school in Montana called Mission Mountain School. Um, for another 18 months um, where like my frostbite was never treated. Um, I still have significant long-term physical issues from both my programs. I actually did a second wilderness program before this one. That was a voluntary one and it was, it was bad, but it wasn't like traumatizing or abusive. It well, just you volunteered to be there. And yeah, well, and it wasn't, it wasn't really a traditional like wilderness program either. Like the therapeutic, uh, component, um, of it was, was not the extensiveness that a lot of current wilderness programs use. Um, and it wasn't like we had sufficient gear. Our parents bought all our gear. We had, um, everything we could possibly need for any weather condition. We never ran out of food. We always had more than enough. Um, those kinds of things. And the staff, like our, our therapy consisted of journaling. Basically it was like guided journaling sitting in the woods. Um, and we hiked no more than four miles a day. Um, so it wasn't like what you think of when you think of wilderness. Um, yeah. it was kind of like a toned down version. So I don't really count it, but yeah, I did go to another program before this. Uh, so I did a total of 20 ish months in programs from 2003 to 2005. Yeah. And when you went in, you were 17. 16. I turned 17 in wilderness. I turned 18 at my boarding school and left at 18 and a half. Yeah. But they, but there are people who they, they don't tell you when your birthday is and you lose track of time because they, but they don't, you know, the, like the, not so much the wilderness camps where you're out there, where you're out there in the elements where you can see the sun's rising and setting and all that stuff. But the, like the people that in the programs that they talk about in the, in the program, um, that documentary, that they, they had the windows blacked out inside their facility. You couldn't tell if it was night or daytime. And- One of my favorite personal examples of that is I, from November of 2004 until I left my program in June of 2005, I did not know who the president was. Yeah. Because we had an election in November. They didn't tell us anything. I had no clue who it was until I left. Yeah, I think that was when... There were, uh, there were girls there during 9-11. They had no idea that happened until, it, like, years later. like Or, like, you know, months to years later. You see somebody going to, you know, they get out and they're like, hey, we're going to New York City. Where the hell did the Twin Towers go? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Basically... That yeah, it's bad. Good. I mean, that was bad. I'm sorry. A good like pop culture reference would be sh- the Shawshank Redemption, the the one prisoner that's been in his whole life and he gets out and he's just it's it's culture shock. He has yeah. no idea how to function because he has no lived experience of any kind of society or culture or you know like day to day function even. Uh, the a way that a lot of us describe it is like when, when you get out of those places, it's like you suddenly realize like, holy crap, it's like time has completely stopped for me, but nobody else. Yeah. Like you're, you're just kind of like in a holding pattern and standstill the, the whole time you're there. And then you get out and you're like, holy crap, all of this stuff has happened. And I had no idea. 
And people talk about it like it's like you should, they expect you to know about that kind of stuff. Like there's, there's a lot of like culture, like pop culture stuff, like music and entertainment and, and true crime and things like that, that people will reference. And, and if I don't remember, cause I have a great memory for things like that. If I don't, if I don't remember it, my response is probably, uh, yeah, that's probably from what, 2003 to 2005. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's like a, a lot of stuff, you know, that, I mean, I can, I can relate to that too, because mm-hmm. obviously I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to watch TV. I wasn't yeah. able to watch movies and stuff like that. What I did, I did, you know, like on the down low. Um, mm-hmm. but, but there's a lot of things just like, a, well, well, like I've, I've, to this day, I've never seen 16 candles. I've never seen dirty dancing. Yeah. And because those movies came out while I was still. <laughs> And the and yeah. like I, I and I never really had any desire to watch them afterwards. So I, some some movies I did, some movies I went back and watched, but you know, like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, I saw that one. I mean, every teenage boy is going to want to see that movie. But, I love that movie. That is a great <laughs> fucking movie. My mom let me rent that because the cover of it was like nondescript <laughs> and innocent. <laughs> She had, and she re- let me rent it over and over and over again. Like I rented that thing every weekend for like two years <laughs> until she found out what it actually, like she actually watched it herself. She's like, oh my God, what have I been allowing? <laughs> yeah. But I can, yeah, I, I can definitely relate on that aspect because of the fact that, you know, it, you know when you're sheltered of all of that stuff, you don't know. I mean, I, I caught up on a lot of things. Yeah, but then again, there's my... still a lot that I'll never catch up on. Yeah, but I just there's no there's no reason or purpose for me to 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 store that knowledge at this point. <laughs> Funny story, you know, once everything folded and everything, and I had moved out of my mom's house and in with my dad. One of the first things I did was I watched Top Gun. Yeah, and yeah, you know, because that that movie had come out and everybody was talking about it. And I would actually get made fun of because I hadn't seen Top Gun, you know? So I, so I get I'm that like, a lot too. People will be like, wait, you don't know about that. <laughs> and then I'm like, story time. <laughs> so I finally watched it. I didn't really care for the movie. I didn't think it was that good. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that. I actually had that response to a lot of things that I, that I tried to catch up on. Um, I was just like, why was this important? Cause we weren't there in that moment. So we didn't see, we didn't see any of the hype or the reasoning or the, the, any of it. Right. We're seeing it completely from the outside as like, what are these crazy people doing? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> but, um, and, and Paul, there's, there's also part of the enforcement tactics and part of the rehab tactics, tactics that they use and, troubled teen industry are are border you know they're they would violate the geneva convention oh i use biderman's chart of coercion to describe it uh it's a document from 1956 that was developed by the army um as basically a cheat sheet for the most effective uh torture of prisoners of war Hmm. they use every one of those tactics just about every tactic, technique, and approach the programs use at its core has one of those tactics that were outlined back in the 50s wow. as a, this is the best way to break somebody. Yeah, and they they also... You back know, by the U.S. government. And the, the, the way that they do this, the way that they market it to parents, the way they is they basically they brainwash the parents before the kids even have any idea what's going on. Mm. They mm. they they basically they they find like the greatest salesman on the face of the planet. You know, somebody could like could like sell ice to an Eskimo. Yeah, hey, here's no. a summer here's a summer camp to get your kids off the street during the summer. That's exactly you, you are as exactly a, right. You are exactly right. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but so, but the, but one thing that they do is just like, okay, your kids, if you talk to them, but that's another thing. They don't let you talk to your parents after until like you've achieved a certain level in these programs and they don't, um, you know, they won't let you talk to your parents, but they also tell the parents, your kids might say things. Remember your kids are master manipulators, yep. master manipulators. They, 
that that's what that's what got that's why you couldn't you know control them at home because they manipulated you they're going to try to manipulate you again mm-hmm. you know so that's how they that's how they <laughs> trap the parents because the parents don't know what to do and in some cases yeah there probably were kids that were like out of out of control and stuff like that yeah but there were a lot more that weren't like like Nora here yeah you know and and it was just like a little little bit, you know, maybe it was a lazy parent. Maybe it was just a little dis- misunderstanding that kind of escalated into something else and the parent freaked. You know, there's a gazillion different reasons why to why a parent would choose to send their kid to a, a, a you know, to look for help. And then, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, the, you get these, you get these salesmen here that it was like, all right, we can help. You know, and, and like the, a lot of the ones out in Utah, they don't even have to pay for a building because they just meet out in the middle of the desert and hike you for the, you're out there in the element in the middle of the Utah desert, you know, under the harshest conditions, the, 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 the hottest dry heat during the summer and some of the most brutal winters in the entire country. Yeah. And you're and out there use, in it. They use federal government and state government land also. Um, one, because I don't have to pay to use it and it's, um, open basically, but also because the, um, hoops that have to be jumped through legislatively to even try to go after anything that might happen out there is just, people don't see it as worth it. Our, our, our politicians in Utah are just as they're deeply tied into this. Well, your, um, gov- your our government. Entire, our entire economy is based around the TTI. Intermountain Healthcare is our biggest healthcare system. It is like massive. That's tied into the TTI. All of our politicians have ties to it. I mean, Mitt Romney owned Aspen Education Group for a while, and they were one of the biggest umbrella companies of TTI programs at the time. Um, so, you know, a vast amount of his money came from legalized child abuse. Wow. Yeah. And what's concerning is there's a, this is still going on. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's We've more, it's bigger, one it's bigger politician than on our ever. side. It's bigger than ever. It's bigger than it ever has been. And this started back in the seventies with, wow. I think teen challenge was the originator was the original one. Yeah. I've, I've actually, I call that the modern um branch of the tti uh yeah, yeah. really the residential programs for troubled kids started with a different kind of operational program um they were more like group homes or like work ranches uh but those started back at like the brown schools opened in the 1940s yeah uh and uh after i think at one point they owned uh the Elon school and Synanon. Um, yeah yeah Synanon was one of the <laughs> ogs with, as far as modern mm-hmm. is concerned I, I bring up teen challenge because i knew about that one growing up yeah it i mean it, it it's crazy because i i bought it i mean teen challenge i, I grew up married Island, florida paul knows where that is but um <clears throat> but i you know i grew up there and there was a there was Teen Challenge, and everybody knew about it. It was this place where you know troubled kids went to. It was this camp and all that stuff and everything. And you know, in, in your episodes seventy three and seventy four, I um you know I talked about how like after I had gotten it, I had gone to this you know, gotten away from the cult. I had gone to to this church, and they Teen Challenge brought a group of people up there, and they were basically singing songs about Teen Challenge. I'm like. You're worshiping Teen Challenge in a church. You're not worshiping God. You're worshiping, and that struck. But I was I was like less than a less than less than a year and a half out out of the cult at that point. Mm-hmm. But I got this book. It's called um, it's called oh, what the hell? Is it? Like I can't believe I'm alive. Uh-huh. It's a and I haven't gotten all the way through it yet. But but this this woman. You know, she's, she's been through everything. She's been through a cult. She's been through Team Challenge. She's been through, you know, it, I, just the, you name it. She's been through it. And one of, the, one of the, the stories that she talks about in that book is she got shipped Team Challenge in Merritt Island, Florida 
<laughs> and she wow. she kind of goes through her um her experience and everything there and i was living in Merritt island at the time oblivious to the fact that that shit was going on there during right. that time when you were going to church and they were bringing those groups, did were you aware of what those groups were and what was your like viewpoint towards them? Like, I knew, like were you, I, were you aware and, and had you been taught essentially that these are bad kids? Like be careful around these kids. Like, were you well, aware of that? I was, I was 15. I mean, I, I, I said it was less than a year after the cult had folded and I moved in with my dad. But, um, but, but I, I got with this group of, you know, when I, when I moved in with my dad up that I changed schools and I got with this group of um, metalheads and, um, but they were Christian metalheads. So my, my first band was a Christian rock band, but, um, metal music is a gateway drug, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but so I, I start going to their church and everything and they brought teen challenge in to do it and all that stuff and it's just like well we, well, we were we were told to have tagline these these kids were having trouble growing up and all that stuff and everything blah 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 yeah, they, they, they kind of make you feel sorry for them but also being like be careful they're dangerous but it's, i was it, i was the, i was the only one I, I even said something i'm i'm just like does it does i'm just like does and i didn't even at this point i had not even made the connection that i was raised in a cult yet at that point you know you didn't but, realize just how much like those kids you were Exactly. But, but they're up there. Thank you. We love teen challenge or whatever. I don't remember the exact song or whatever. And I was just like, this is weird. This is really freaking weird. You're in a church. This is its own sanction. This didn't happen like during a church service. This was its own like special event and everything that we, you know, like on a special, you know, like a special event and everything. It was like a variety show type of thing. And, um, and they're they're up there. It's like oh, they have Teen Challenge and all that stuff. And they 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 had they brought one of the leaders of Teen Challenge up to talk about it and everything and and how they're 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 close knit with you know with God and all that stuff and everything. And you know they 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 had the the kids lined up on stage. I'm glad we got a chance to like really talk about this now because we didn't have time in your episodes. I kind of mentioned it a little bit, but. I'm glad I have a chance to really explain it now because it, 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 I think it fits better in this episode than it does in, in the other two. But they they had like they had like ten kids up on the um, up on stage behind them or you know you know behind the like the, the two you know authority people or whatever that were there, and they're talking about how oh, well well James here he was on drugs Jane, Jimmy here he was running with gangs um Cindy here she was a prostitute you know it's just like telling us and I'm think I'm I'm looking at these kids and I'm just and I'm I'm not buying it mm. you know I'm like I I don't know I, I maybe it's true maybe it's not then they started singing and the song were very high that kid never touched drugs and she's I still know, a virgin. You know, I know, but I'm like, you know, it, and then they started singing the songs and that's what really rubbed me the wrong way. I was just like, you know, you're, you're in a church. If you're singing songs, you should be singing songs about God. You shouldn't be singing songs about teen challenge. You know, it's basically, basically take, take, take God out of a church hymn and replace it with teen challenge. And that's what they were singing. Well, I think that's part of the whole tactic. They paint themselves as false prophets and people believe them as such. Mm -hmm. And it has the same outcome as cults do. You I mean, surround yourself with the good, with the good intentions around that atmosphere. Yeah. You put yourself in that atmosphere of good and holy. Blah, blah, blah. Now, out of everybody that was there, out of everybody, everybody, out of everybody that was there to, to watch this, I was the only one. That was scratching my head about it. Speaking of music about programs, a few weeks ago, before the program came out, you sent me a demo of a song you wrote about the TTI that is in fucking credible, dude. Thanks. You you're did the, such a good job on that. You're the only one that's heard that demo. Well, I can't wait to hear the final. Oh, you have heard version. you have you have heard the final version, but <gasps> really. I sent you the demo. Oh, that's right. You yeah. did. That was the first one. You did something, both of them. Mm -hmm. Because I, I was, I, had, right. I had woke up that morning or I had woke up one morning. That song did not exist. By the time I went to bed, mm -hmm. that song was recorded. And, um, 
But by the time I got done to putting the guitar solos in it and mixing it down, I had been working on it all day. My brain was fried. I think you sent that to me at like three o'clock in the morning while I was on my way home from karaoke. (laughs) Yeah. And I, and then, and and I, I called you the next day and I'm just like, you know, I was just like, what do you think? You're like, I love it. I'm like, uh, should I go back in there and do, do some stuff? Well, we talked about a couple tiny little nuances too. They, they... Well, the guitar solo in it was terrible. <laughs> and the, the drums were like non-existent. What guitar did you record the solo on? The solo that was on my Ibanez. I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have to send you a screenshot. Remind me later. Um, but, then, but then I, um, but then like the next day I went in and I brought the drums up a little bit. I redid the guitar solo and then I said, yeah, the mixing was definitely a lot better in the second one. And yeah, it's called, you, tell you refined it to where it needed to be. Yeah. But like I said, you're the only person that's heard that original draft and <laughs> that, that original was, draft no longer exists. So good. I mean, and it's funny because like in needing to take a break from the activism and music being like, like I'm one of those people that when absolutely nothing else can motivate me to stay alive, music can. Um, and I threw myself into this. I don't even know what it's called. Like I kind of call it a, a music magazine covering the local music scene, mm-hmm. but like I do all kinds of stuff. Like I just interviewed to manage a band and I'm going to be shadowing a photographer and like, I'm just all over the place. Like I do content creation and graphic design and like all kinds of, I just basically right now, my whole life is set up around being able to drop everything that I'm doing to be creative and everything that I do in my free time is creative in some way. Right. Well, um, before we, before we move on that, that song is called troubled. So they say, and it's on Bill Selby on all platforms and, you know, and, oh, and Paul, instead of doing the outro, um, I'm just going to send you that song. I will, we'll play it at the end of the, at this episode in, in place of the outro. Ah, okay. All right. Cool. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I wouldn't even thinking about it i mean i I was thinking about it but i'd forgotten about it because this we've gotten like pretty heavy into this so <laughs> i've been looking for a window since we got on here <laughs> <laughs> now that song that song <laughs> i wrote it from the point of view of somebody who was in it at the time and, well, and it's so funny like i've come across a number of songwriters who if they don't have prior knowledge of the tti have some kind of person, either some kind of personal experience that gives them a deeper understanding of it or they've experienced it in a different way. Yeah. Like, um, one of our local artists here, who's a therapist now worked in programs. Um, and he was one of those people who was, I, you know, can't imagine that he was not deeply traumatized by it because I've never heard anybody until him. And then you, put into words what it's like to be a kid living in one of those places and then what it's like to have to live with that trauma after. Yeah. Like you guys didn't even live that, but you have enough empathy to like be able to put into words our feelings and our experiences. Well, the, the, the first line of the song is um, abducted from the night abducted in the night from the safety of my bed um will i see the dawn or will i they end up dead um and and it and then on like on the side i say did they kill my family because your family's not there yeah where's your family did they kill my family and then they're dragging you out and it's just like blinded and tied they drag me to my fate and everything and, and <sighs> they're, they're not telling me anything and then like leading out of the first verse that little aside, it says, um, discarded by my family. Yeah. You know, so I usually don't use the same end last word in a, in, in a verse like that. But I like at, at the beginning of the verse, they're concerned about their family. And then they find out they've been discarded by their family. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's just like I, I put myself in the mindset of, and I wouldn't have been able to do this song if it hadn't been for episode 73 and 74. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Yeah, just it's funny. So you 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 co-wrote that song. <laughs> I 
I've actually co-wrote three TTI songs like that. <laughs> um, two of them are still in 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 progress, and I've not actually heard so or any first. parts of them in a while. But I was first. Yep. First, first. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's weird. Like I was I was I was telling a girl, the one who was saying she was afraid of getting involved in activism, and I was like, you'll find that once you start telling people can't stop this happened to me they are hooked they want to hear this shit and it does not take it's never taken me more than five minutes for somebody to be like holy fuck what do we do to shut these down Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. it it's not hard and you're not fighting against anything like the things we're fighting against are like program owners and politicians and shit like like the big guns well, the thing when is, when it comes to society, this outrages people mm-hmm. when they find out it exists. Well, the, the thing, the thing that some, you know, and I, and I'm talking once again as a cult survivor, but, um, one thing that people, like if they were, if they were part of this, if they were part of this through no fault of their own, and I'm talking to TTI survivors and cult survivors who are in the closet, so to speak, and haven't and haven't decided to come out, you know, go public yet. Yeah, you you are going to get some backlash, but you know mm-hmm. what? People that give you backlash, I got two words for them: fuck them. Mm-hmm. Because they 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 weren't there, they don't know what the hell they're talking about, and they're not worth your damn time. That's what I would tell any survivor, cult, um, TTI, um, child abuse. Drug traffic, you know, uh, sexual, you know, sexual trafficking, which, well, TTI is trafficking, but, um, you know, any survivor that, that has got this, you know, it's, it's just like finally, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go public with it until just a few years ago. You know, mm-hmm. like when I did episodes 10 and 11 of, of Crimes Coast Cults and Beer, that was the first time I had told the story. And, you know, so it's just like, I'm, but, but yeah, it's just like the, 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 the gratification that you get from, by going public and getting your story out there, getting it off your chest and putting it in, into the ears of other people. It's, it's so, it's so gratifying, mm-hmm. but, it, and, and it's just like, yeah, there are going to be people, there have been people that have come at me, but the people that have come at me are people that still believe the doctrine that that cult was preaching. And you know what? They can go fuck themselves. And you find that the vast majority of people look at that shit and think, what in the fuck? The people person, who are these things are insane. One person sent me an email. I'm not going to listen to your podcast episodes because I don't want to hear you um, defame a righteous man and i i re- i replied back to him i said well why don't you listen and then tell me everything i got wrong mm-hmm. never heard a word from him again <laughs> yep yeah when you force mm-hmm. truth down people's throats they can't help but swallow it eventually <laughs> 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 Great analogy. <laughs> they can't, yeah. can't, they can't help <laughs> That was great. <laughs> I use that analogy for a lot of stuff. I actually, uh, when I'm asking a friend if I've introduced them to music, I ask them if I force fed them this certain band yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, citizen soldier. Yep. <laughs> I had to think there for a second because I was still laughing about what you said before. Then you said that. I was like, crap, now I got to think about something else. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, citizen soldier is fucking awesome. Those guys are starting a tour in April. Uh, he's actually the, um, the former staff that used to work in programs. Oh, really? Um, yeah, the the one that gave me the first outsider validation that was like, like hit me like a train in terms of like, whoa, somebody who didn't experience this actually understands it. I did a whole interview with him 
where I got into it. And I, the second I broached the topic of the TTI, he went on an eight minute long rant. That was the longest answer to a question he gave me and outlined every single problem and what makes the TTI dangerous. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible rundown of like, it's like a, it's, oh, it's a great summary of, of how the TTI damages people. And, and he touches on the fact that it, it's lifelong and it's not just impacting the kid and involving the kid, but it needs to involve the whole family and the household. Like he acknowledges so many little tiny nuances in just those eight minutes that it was just, I was blown away by, by the fact that somebody understood all of that having never experienced it. Yeah. <clears throat> so now, one thing that I okay, you you said that you, there's one politician that that supports this. I'm assuming that that politician is probably a Democrat. I well, don't think he is. Oh, really? Because well, Mitt Romney's a Republican, you know, and a lot of the other people that like took you know, the the other politicians that took money from TTI, they're mostly Republicans. That's why I was. No, asking. he's he's a Republican. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I think he has had to be so careful in in the in the directions that he chooses to take, and well, especially being a Republican what he takes on exactly being a Republican in a Republican state trying to speak out against Republicans. You gotta you gotta tread carefully. Yeah. Um. That's I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I mean, I, I figured, and that threw me. Okay, who who is it, and what has he been doing to um, you know, what what what's he what's he been doing as far as um like trying to to push this um in because un, unlike cults, cult a cult a cult is like a local government a local law enforcement mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. TTI is federal, at least it should be. Yeah. Good. Um, so what is, what has he been, who, who is it and what has he been doing? So I mean, it was my, and, and, and by the way, don't, 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 don't pepper. You know, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the listeners. Don't pepper his office with letters because he's, he's doing, he's, 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 he's doing the right thing. Yeah, please don't. He won't return my calls. So, <laughs> so. no, he's, he's just really busy. And like I said, Utah has been hit with a lot of TTI related incidents and like press coverage in the last couple of years. And I imagine it's getting oh, turned up to 11 shit. right about now. Yeah. It is, I mean, think, think about everything that we've had go on in the last two years here. TTI related. Every single time one of those things happens, every death, every time somebody speaks out, every time a program gets put on conditional status, every time a program gets shut down because two fucking insane ass journalists decide they're going to uncover shit, uh, and, and expose it. <laughs> um, he, he gets, he gets it mm. like, uh, and it's, it's, uh, we haven't gone more than two or three months without one of those in the last two years. Good. But yeah. He's, he's, I can tell you that this is something that, is very actively on his mind and has been for quite a while. Um, his first involved. So, so his main focus uh, in terms of like agenda um, before he got involved in TTI stuff was uh, adoption, foster care, um, like children's rights kind of things, uh, which when I found that out, I was like, Oh yeah, this guy, this, you know, he's a good guy. Like he's the kind of person we want on our side. I was adopted. So, um, Anybody who's going to speak up for people who are put in a position of having to be silent about that kind of trauma um, in a position of power, like, has my respect. Um, and he's done the same thing for the TTI uh, in, 2000, in 2021. Yeah. He worked with Paris Hilton on State Bill 127, which was a complete overhaul of our entire legislative documentation regarding congregate care programs in Utah and how they they can operate. They went after every single little detail. Like there, there are clauses in that bill that say that programs cannot use repetitive motion as 
uh, as punishment, specifically including but not limited to push-ups, sit-ups, running laps, et cetera. Or repetitive um, for like hours, like in, in the program, you said you hadn't watched yeah. it. These two girls, um, <laughs> like, um, hands together, hands apart, or palms together, palms apart, mm-hmm. palms up, palms down. They had to do that for like eight hours mm-hmm. straight. Cool. And they, they did yep. it, they did it like, like for a minute, for just for a minute, like in, in the, in the documentary. And mm-hmm. it's just, like, just a minute, it had me ready to freaking shoot myself. Yeah. After a minute. Yeah. Eight, eight, and, and, and they what, had to do it for eight hours straight. Exactly. And, and, and what, like, my the big thing my program used was calisthenics, so squats and lunges, or running laps. But we would do it for hours on end. Like, uh, we are actually in that in the group that I've been involved in with people from my program. One thing, one thing that's been consistently coming up is the. So it was supposed to be a school, but we never went to school. We spent our school hours doing repetitive punishment for the most part. They'd find something to punish us for. And then they'd be like, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to have to do this before we can go to school. And then by the time we were finished, it was time to go to the next thing. Um, so it, it was kind of like a way to like for them to, as an excuse for them to not teach us educationally and academically. Um, but yeah, it was the the repetitive punishment. But yeah, State Bill 127 targeted specific tactics of programs like that, like in very detailed ways. Um, and and it took a, it took about a year or so for it to kind of catch on. But like the reason that um, the state was able to penalize um, and go after Diamond Ranch Academy was because that bill outlined the process that allowed them to. It made, well, one, it made what they were doing officially illegal. And two, it also required them to keep strict and detailed documentation of every single incident. So when they went in and they looked at those incident reports, two, one of two things would happen. One, those doc, that documentation would not exist and the program would get hit with a bunch of shit for that or that documentation exists exactly how it's supposed to and gives them all the evidence they need to hit them with other things. So the state has been able to go after diamond ranch, been able to go after Daniel's Academy. Uh, and both of them have been shut down because the new laws, uh, where's, where's diamond the, ranch? State the authority to do that. Where's diamond ranch? Hurricane Southern Utah. You have desert. to go through there on the way to LA or Vegas. Okay. So in the desert. Um, I was. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. It's-, it's the only thing that's there. It's a tiny little town. And having been there, I mean, there's, there's, it's all small local businesses and Time and Ranch Academy. Yeah, it just, it just rang, it just rang a bell. There, there's yeah. like some sort yeah, of. I mean, I don't, I'm not surprised that somebody tried to get Diamond or a, a program in Diamond Ranch's place up and running again so quickly. Because that program was fueling the entire city, the entire county's economy. Between St. George and Hurricane, those places live on program money. Wow. Like, the, and, and I said when I went down to Hurricane, seeing how small it was, I was like, no fucking wonder they hate us so much for shutting it down. Yeah. This, and- like, this would have tanked their entire economy. Like, people lost jobs. Everybody lost money. Every single one of those tiny local businesses lost the majority of their business and the majority of their income because that money wasn't coming in anymore and it was not getting spent within the city. Well, it's like, it's like when slavery was abolished. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just like, <laughs> uh, Paul, take a, take a wild guess as to how much one year per kid costs at one of, well, hold on. No, not a year, not a year, because these things are marketed initially as like five weeks, six weeks, something like that. Yeah. So, so just take it, just take a stab at it. How much do you think? Like, just, let's just say it's six weeks. Just take a stab. For the cost of one child. Yeah. To, to go through the program concluding they go from start to finish and they get out when they're supposed to. 
Oof, six weeks. Wait, I'd say probably it, it, anywhere between uh, twenty to thirty thousand. You're pretty close. <laughs> Wait for the whole time. For the like the six weeks. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 pretty close. Yeah. Hmm. Diamond Ranch uh, had um, uh, like 120 students. Wow. And they were charging at about 12 grand a month per student. Mm -hmm. That's over a million dollars a month. Yeah, and, and and we're not even talking about you you would think for that kind of money you'd think they'd be staying at like the Hilton or something like that. Yeah. No no pun intended. But the population, um, the population of Hurricane in twenty twenty was just over twenty thousand. Yeah, and basically you've got you know that and that all, program all was money. bringing in about a million and a half dollars. I mean overall, I mean but these programs don't take that money and use it for no, the program. No, it goes right? to the mansion. It goes to the mansion that belongs to the um the like the And then the it owner. feeds the local economy. Right. That's where the because all that they money have, goes because to. they because have they, to do business because, with all the locals to stay on the good side. <clears throat> but what the kids mm-hmm. live in, they live in squalor. They live yeah. in the, they live in a building that should have been condemned 20 years ago. So they bringing in a million and a half dollars a month in a town of 20,000 people suddenly getting that entire source of income shut off. Yeah. Like no wonder they literally, we had cops follow us out of the County when we left, when we left Hurricane, they followed us around town the whole time. They shattered us the whole time. They kept a close eye on us and they were not afraid to make sure we knew it. Uh And the only thing we were there, we didn't, we didn't cause a scene. We didn't cause problems. People knew who we were before we were we even got there. It's like how dare um, how dare you how dare you um be upset just, because we just the concept you. and the idea that oh hey I heard that there might be some survivors from these kind of programs showing up had two thirds of their entire police force there. Unreal. Wow. I am going to tap out. You have full control, brother. All right. Um, You know, glad, you know, (laughs) hope hope you can be on more of these. Definitely. Definitely. And um, I I know you want to continue this, uh, this conversation with Nora, maybe on, on the flip side too, because I'm starting a program for podcasters. um, And uh, I'll, I'll bring you up to speed a little bit on this bill too. Um, Cool. And uh, it was something I was working on a few weeks ago. And I'll get her your um. I'll get her your your Facebook information and and whatnot. You guys can connect. Cool. Yeah. cool. Sounds cool. good. Nora, glad to nice meet, meet you. you. See ya. Still, you have a good one, everybody. I'll be back on the flip side. All right. We'll see you <laughs> next episode. All right. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> yeah. Like I, like I said, I mean, he, he has to be up for work at like one o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> at least he didn't have to tap out mid episode. <laughs> it was yeah. doing dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like now we're, you know, if, if, uh, we're probably going to wrap it up in like the next 20 minutes or so. Yeah. But, um, but no, it, it, it was, it was on. And I, I was watching him too. I mean, you could, you could tell that he was just like, if he didn't have those sunglasses on, his face, yeah. his eyes would have been as big as his lenses were, because I mean, you could tell. It's this, but you know what? There's At two this more. Point, there's it's two, an expected response for me. Like I've talked to enough people about it that it's just like. But there's two more eyes that are open. There's yeah. two more eyes that are open, and he, mm-hmm. he, you know, he his, <clears throat> he has a lot more listeners than Crimes Goes Coles and Beer does for his podcast. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like I said, all it takes to get people to want to be part of making this change is telling them that this exists. As soon right. as they know this is a thing, most people are like, where do you want me? What can I do? Like, and then they go on to like talk to other people and, um, like, 
I, I, I'm impressed and I'm proud of our survivor community and the work that everybody's done in the last few years. Yeah. Um, because this is a fight that, that survivors have been doing since the seventies right. and it hasn't gained any traction until the last couple of years. And now all of a sudden it's like, people finally want to listen to us. Like, and what's interesting is that if, if you look at, at a, a good, like the vast majority of the people who are like officially like leading this movement in any kind of like public capacity, they're all in their thirties. They're all from my age group. They all went to programs 15 to 25 years ago. Um, and, and we're kind of the, the, the generation that's taken the lead on let's fucking do something about this. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I mean, I mean, it, it's been around like, you know, the, those kids that were at that church service I was telling you about with Teen Challenge, those are, those kids are like my age, you know, at the time. And we're I know talking, women, I know women like, who were in programs before you were born. Yeah. Well, who've been, well, who've been actively trying to fight this since like then. Like Wendy, she's, she is some, I don't know if she's a little bit older than me or a little bit younger than me. I don't know, but she was, you know, she was part of it. And, um, yeah, and she, yeah, I, yeah, so it, it's, it's been going, it, it has been going on and everything, but it's just like, you know, your, your generation, your generation, you know, the, the people that were in it in the nineties and the early two thousands, um, are the ones that are basically, you know, just like, you know, pick, picking up, you know, just picking up the, picking up the flag and yeah. know, storming, storming yeah, the gates. We, we've been the ones who are like, okay, let's fucking do this shit. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, I, I always say that like every like generation, like every 10 years or so of people who've been in these places, like everybody has a really valuable role to play in this because the people who were there before you were born shows the longevity of these places and, right. and the fact that they've been able to maintain for that long. And well, when I was at a program now who are saying they treated us the same way they treated you back in the seventies. Right. And well, that's when, incredibly validating for everybody, but it also shows that, Hey, nothing's changed. Yeah. When, when I was, um, when I first spoke out in public uh, uh, about it, it wasn't on CKCB. It was on the human monsters podcast. And, um, you know, he had me on and I brought on two people, you know, that were in the cult as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think I was, I don't know, 47 or 48 when I went on that show. I'm 50 now, but, um, but I, I brought a guy who was like 10 years younger than me and a girl that was 10 years younger than him. So that, there's, there's three generations right there that were all affected by the same cult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's why, that's, that's why we had those, those people, those, those people specific. I, yeah. I, did, I did that on purpose just to show. Yeah. I, I actually, um, I, I have a podcast episode that I I've recorded, uh, with two people from my wilderness program, one who went 10 years after me and one who went, uh, like a year or two ago, right before, like they closed this past summer. Um, but they, this person went like a year or two ago. So like I had like me from before the rebrand, and then another girl who'd been there 10 years after me and then somebody who was 10 years after them. And it was, it's always like disgustingly validating, I guess this is the best way to put it. Right. When you hear people who've experienced almost the identical things to you 20, 30, 40 years after you did. Yeah. They're and see. I mean, would I, would yeah. I go, would I go Nothing hang out with a, changed. would I go, would I, would I go like hang out with a 30 year old? Probably not. Would I go hang out with a 30 year old who grew up in the, in faith assembly? Yeah, I would. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. Because um, <laughs> I hang out. I mean, my team, my low, we have a local TTI group that meets occasionally. I, I'm, there's, I, I don't know what to call us. I'm, I'm going to come up with a name for us. There's three of us. There's three women who are all my age, late thirties. Um, and then all the rest of us are 
kids in their like guys in their twenties, eighteen to twenty four. Mm-hmm. So, it's, but you all have it, that common ground, though. You yeah, exactly. Have common ground. Exactly. And it's funny because I actually found most of the, I mean, a couple of the kids in the group, um, like the kid I'm mentoring and then, um, the one who, I, who's kind of like helping me with him. Um, those two found me through my discord, but most of the local survivors I've found have come because I drop a trauma bomb of, Hey, I went to programs while I'm out at the bar at karaoke. And then people <laughs> are like, wait a minute. Wait, what? Me too. And then like, I, I love those moments because you get to see like the realization on their face that holy fuck, I'm not alone. Mm. And I've spent years thinking I was the only one. The best, the best experience that I had with that was on my drive back from LA for survivor prom. I had the kid I'm mentoring with me um, and I needed to go to a, into a vape shop, but he's 18. So he couldn't come in. So I left him in the car. I go inside. I'm wearing a citizen, so- wearing a citizen soldier shirt. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> um, and I walk in and the kid doesn't get through the sentence. He's like, Oh, Hey, how are you? How can I get? Holy fuck citizen soldier. I fucking love those guys. And we get to talking and then I start telling him, you know, my connection to Jake and about the interview I did with him a bit where he talks about all of this. And, and the kid just goes, Oh, wait, like residential programs. I went to one of those places and I was like, which one, what years? And he tells me. And then my only response was Outback Therapeutic Expeditions, Mission Mountain School, 2003, 2005. That kid just lost like three inches in height and just started bawling. Because he'd been so alone for so long. Like, he was so thoroughly convinced that he was the only one of us on Earth. And then not only do I walk into his store and be like, trauma bonding, bitch. But (laughs) then I'm like, I just came from this huge event in L.A. where there's 300 of us together in one place. Yeah. And, like, pull him into that community of, like, understanding like like finally feeling like you belong and people get you without you having to justify the trauma yeah and that's that that yeah that's it and i I haven't found like a whole treasure trove of cult survivors to compare notes with but you know but i found you you know i mean you know they're they're close they're pretty similar they're 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 cousins (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Col- Colt and TTI, they're cousins. So, well, and I think, I think, I think the like mainstream understanding of how cults operate and stuff. I mean, it's still very limited, but most people have some understanding that one cults brainwash people and they're bad. <laughs> so when you when you can draw parallels between something like the TTI, well, you and have a cult leader and well known. You have a cult leader, exactly. and you have the TTI president. Mm-hmm. The same thing. Exactly. The only difference, when, the, only, the, the, only difference that makes, the only difference that makes TTI worse is it's backed by the government. Yeah. So And it's just it's justified as well, nothing else helps these kids. So right. you know, we have to give it a try to save them. Like it's for our own good. Yep. So well this has been yeah, you know, this has been everything that I this this because the no, there was no script here for either one of us. <laughs> this is completely unscripted. This is completely off the cuff and everything. I'm just like, you know, you know what? I, I, I'm like, let's just do it. Let's just do it and see what, see what happens. I you love know. the impromptu stuff. I actually have an interview to do tomorrow with a band. Um, I'm helping with a local music festival. Uh, and so they have me like doing the uh, kind of like press coverage, I guess. Mm-hmm. I'm interviewing all the bands. I'm going to do like fan and crowd, like reactions and things like that during the shows. And it's going to be a lot of fun, but I've got some interviews to do tomorrow and I am not prepared. I have no questions. (laughs) 
but they always end up better like that because you get into topics and things that I think you, I think conversation gets deeper when it's unscripted. Right. It does. I agree. It's more raw. I, <clears throat> there's a difference between doing an interview and covering a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. So, so. You know, thanks, thanks for, thanks for coming on and, you know, doing the first uh, official, officially as, as far as like carrying the name CKCB presents episodes, even though it's the second C- one. It's just, <laughs> this is the first one that started the episode with the, the name. So <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be able to spread awareness about this on yeah. platforms that, that want to support it but thanks for that definitely thanks for coming on and um and definitely you know keep listening because we're gonna have the song at the end of that at the end of you know when when we say goodbye which we are going to do right now anyway until next time later hey fuckers Oh